Vision in the Google Dictionary is described as the ability to think about or plan the future with imagination or wisdom. Do you know that? One of the definitions of vision. It is the ability to plan the future with imagination or wisdom. We use it in the workplace, don't we? We use it in our own personal lives, and we all have dreams and ambitions, desires for our futures. But where does vision come from? It can come from a boss. Have you ever had a boss or a leader in your life be like, this is the vision for our company, and this is your job from now on? You're like, yay. All right, it can come from your boss. It can come from your spouse, just in case you were wondering too, right? It can come from your spouse. It can come from someone you, can, you respect. It could come from a friend, a book, or even a podcast, all right? But often, vision, we find vision in ourselves as our dreams develop in our own hearts. Isn't that true? As you think about life and you learn and you grow, there's like, you have dreams and ambitions that rise up and it's a vision of where I could see myself down the road. So let me ask you this. If you can get vision from all these people and places, is it possible to get vision from God? Have you thought about that? Is it possible to get vision from God? I mean, if your boss or your friend or your coworker or a podcast could give you a vision, a greater idea for a brighter future, couldn't God give you one? That gets me excited. Let me ask you this. This will be our question then. How do you know when you have a God-sized vision? I let first service give some answers. They were great. Somebody said, well, it's oftentimes a God-sized vision comes when I've walked astray from God for a season and God's bringing me back and I'm focused on him and I, I, I really get God's vision. That's a man's great answer. Somebody said, it's usually when it's something I wouldn't have thought of and I added to that or I don't want to do. <laughs> Isn't that true? You know it's a God-sized vision if you don't want to do it. I threw in, you know it's a God-sized vision if you can't afford it. <laughs> Isn't that true how the Lord works? God's like, I have this great idea. You're like, Lord, use me. And then he tells you, and you're like, Lord, we can't afford that. <laughs> well, Lord, we don't have the ability. We don't have the people power. We, we can't do it. All right? So ultimately, you know you have a God-sized vision when God gives it to you. When God gives it to you. We have a story about, the, about that today. This morning, we are looking at the life of Gideon. And the impossible vision that God gave him. So open up with me to Judges chapter 6. The good news is, is we have a story about Gideon this morning. The bad news is, is I didn't realize we're probably going to be here for three weeks. But that's okay. I'm super excited and I hope you are too. Judges chapter 6. Open it up with me. Judges chapter 6. While you're opening there, I'm going to give you some context to the passage. So Israel is in a different, kind of a unique time frame in their history. They don't have really a designated leader. The Lord is their leader, but they haven't been following him very closely. And so God enabled these judges to rise up and lead his nation in times of revival. But this verse in Judges 17.6 captures the whole theme of the book. It says this, and though day, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Do you know what we call that? Thank you. Chaos. <laughs> Moral and spiritual decline. How many of you guys would say that's true of our nation right now? Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. Woo, it's hard. It's hard. It leads you to dark places, and it led them to dark places, and when they would get themselves into trouble, they would turn and they would cry out to the Lord again. And God would raise up a deliverer to set the people free and restore them to kind of a right walk with God. And at this point in their history, they've coming off of 40 years of peace and prosperity. 40 years of peace and prosperity where they've started to grow complacent before they turn back to sin. And that 40 years had come from Deborah and Barak. Do you guys remember that story? Against the commander of Canaan or the Canaanites, Sisera, I think is how you pronounce his name, and all of his chariots. And God had won this incredible victory. Well, they've had peace for 40 years since then. But verse one, then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. I'm gonna pray for us before we go any further. God, I'm so excited for today. 
I just want to thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our church and what you're doing through our church. And God, we just want to offer our whole hearts to you this morning, Lord, and pray that you would speak to us, Lord, and pray that your word would convict us and sink deep into our hearts, God, and draw us close to you, Lord, and bear fruit for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, let's read that again. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Wow. Well, you'd want to understand that the Midianites were actually descendants of Abraham. Did you guys know that? I, I didn't know that either until I started studying it. We all make note of it when we read it, because we've all read that at the end of Abraham's life, when Sarah died, he took on a wife named Keturah, and she bore him a lot of children. And one of the boys that she bore, his name was Midian. Interesting, huh? And when it came time for Isaac to receive the inheritance, it said that Abraham took the sons, the children of his concubines, and he gave them all gifts, and he sent them away to the east. And that's where the Midianites come from. And Israel has, Israel has met the Midianites before. In fact, they met them twice in the book of Numbers, and they won in a decisive battle over them. But the Midianites are back, coming from the east. And at this point, the people of Midian are Bedouin raiders. That's what they do for a living. There was no water, so they couldn't be Vikings, so they had camels instead. <laughs> it was awesome in a terrifying, horrible way. And they would ride their camels wildly into the land of Israel, and they would loot all the resources. And when they traveled, they would bring all their wives and children and all their resources because they were a Bedouin people. And chances are, some speculate they've probably raided Edom and Moab and Ammon on their way to Israel, right? So they're loaded. Now, you understand that God actually delivered them into the hands of Midian for seven years. Why would God do that? Because of their sin. We know from Hebrews that God disciplines the children that he loves. God disciplines the children that he loves. God wanted his people to walk with him. And when they turned their backs on him, he allowed times of hardship, times of discontentment, times of struggle to come upon them. Why? That they would turn and look to him again. And that's what this story is about. So let's keep reading. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, the strongholds, which are in the mountains. So God's people had to go into hiding. They had to start concealing their resources because every time they got food, the Midianites would come and take it from them. And so instead of living in their homes, now they're living possibly in caves. At least that's where they were hiding all their goods. And they have a heart issue going on, but they haven't realized that. So instead of dealing with it, they're surviving it. They're finding a way to cope with it, but the oppression is heavy. So it was, verse three, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites, and the people of the east, there it is, would come up against them. So a huge cohort, not just the Midianites, but them and their allies come into the nation of Israel. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. So in all the land, they would steal the resources. And all the new animals that were born, they would raid them and take them with them, leaving Israel with nothing. Verse six, so Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. I have a few principles for you this morning, okay? Principle number one, sin ruins good things. Sin ruins good things. Why do I say that? Because God had blessed his people. God had brought them out of Egypt. He had brought them out of oppression. He had brought them into a land of plenty, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land full of good things. And when his people walked with him, man, God blessed them and they prospered. But when they turned away from him, their sin ruined the good things that they had. So true, isn't it? 
Sin ruins good things. But God's not done. And I'll give you the other half of that principle right now. It's sin ruins good things, but God deals with his people's sin. Isn't that true? I always love what Pastor Marcus said. God loves you enough to take you as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. That's the message of the Bible. No, that picture isn't, any true, isn't portrayed more clearly than it is on the cross. Sin ruins good things. Mankind is broken. We are broken. How come our world is so full of pain and hurt and evil and turmoil? It's because we're broken. And even at our best, it's not good enough if you were to hold it to God's standards. And so instead of leaving us to pine away in our own destruction, God deals with our sin. He sent his son, Jesus, born of a woman, raised to, lived a human life, gave himself as an offering on man's behalf. Such a powerful story. God dealt with man's sin so that man could turn to him and through faith in Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, what he had accomplished on the cross, I could receive God's forgiveness and wholeness again. So principle number one is sin ruins good things, but God deals with man's sin. By the way, I think this is a good time to interject it's better to let God deal with your sin now than it is to let him deal with it later. Let God deal with it now. It's hard for me to admit that I'm a sinner. In fact, I've never found an unoffensive way to tell someone about hell. It's just hard for us as people, isn't it? To feel like I've made mistakes and I'm held accountable to it, but that doesn't change the reality of it, that it's true. And it's so much better for me to humble myself now and say, Jesus, Lord, would you save me? than it is to stand before a righteous judge who will ultimately deal with man's crimes and man's sin. I mean, you don't wanna end up there. So much better to say, Lord, deal with my sin. Lord, would you save me? And let Christ's forgiveness fill your heart. So God is working in his people. In verse six, see what happened when God allowed them to struggle? They turned to him. That's what God wanted this whole time. God wanted these people to turn to him. And they cried out to the Lord in verse seven, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel. Let me keep up with my notes. Guys, I love this. That here they are in their sin. God is allowing them to be disciplined but in that discipline, God is starting to bring out that fruit of repentance and they're starting to turn to the Lord. The people are starting to become discontented. And you know, that's the reality of sin. Sin ruins good things, we all said that. But it also tells us that there's more out there, doesn't it? When I start to become discontented, disillusioned with my own sin, because here's the tricky thing about sin. Sin promises me good things, doesn't it? If you just live this way, you'll get that, or you, know, you could gain this, or whatever it promises me. It always promises something good, but in the end, it's so empty. And God allows that emptiness to settle so that I start to hunger for something that's real again. And I turn and I look into the Lord. So they turn and they cry out to the Lord, and God sends the prophet. Now, there's five things I want us to see from the, what the prophet said. Verse eight, then the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all those who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So five things I want to see from what the prophet said, God's message to them. First off, God still identifies with his people. Did you notice that? Here they are. They've been in sin. They've actually been worshiping Baal. They've, it's not just they're in sin. They've fallen into idolatry. They're worshiping a different God, a fake God. And yet, though they've abandoned the Lord, he hasn't abandoned them. In their faithlessness, God has remained faithful. He says right here that the Lord God of Israel. He still identifies as their God. 
The second thing I want us to see is God reminds them of how he redeemed them. God is so good to do that. Look what he says right here. I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. You know what? When I fall into sin, when you and I fall into sin, God is so good to remind us in our brokenness of how he's formerly redeemed us. Because if God could have saved me then, he can save me now. That's why God shares that. You gotta remember, I brought you out of Egypt, right? When you were slaves and you were oppressed and I delivered you. And he can deliver them again. It's just like you and I, when we come to Christ and the cross is so beautiful and salvation happens and we're free from sin and we walk with the Lord, but inevitably we eventually do something stupid. And sometimes when you do something stupid, it's really hard to get up. You're like, how am I gonna get out of this pit? The same way you got out of the last one, God's grace. God's the one who's gonna pick his people up out of the pit. This is the third thing I want us to see. God reminds them of all the good they've ever experienced and how it's come from him. Oh man, I love that about the Lord. He said, I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Why does God do that? Because you and I come to realize quickly when we walk with the Lord that everything good you and I have is an extension of God, isn't it? Have you ever wandered from God for a season and realized how hard life is apart from him? Every good thing you and I have as his children, it's an extension of his grace. It's an extension of his favor and his goodness towards us. And God reminded them of that. The fourth thing God says is he makes his desires clear to them. He wants to be their God. Look what he says right here. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. God wants to be the God of his people. He didn't want them to have idols. He didn't want them to fear other idols. He just wanted them to fear him. Guys, and there's such a good word for you and me in our heart, for you and I in our own hearts today. Is my heart crowded out with fear of things that doesn't really matter? You know, we don't, in America, for the most part, we don't carve little, like little wooden people and worship them, you know? It's like not our thing. Some of us worship our football teams too much. You San Francisco fans out there, I'm talking to you. <laughs> All right, but other than that, we don't really have a lot of physical idols, but that doesn't stop us from worshiping something. So God reminds them, look, I, I want to be your God. And the last thing he says to them is, I want you to obey my voice. God's desire for his people especially, but for all people is that he would be their God and they would hear his voice. The fifth thing that God shows them from the prophet is where they went wrong. They didn't know up to this point. All they knew is life was tough. Okay, life is tough. We've missed something somewhere. And they turn back to the Lord and say, okay, God, we missed something. And by the way, if you're going through a really hard season, that is not a bad question to ask. In fact, write this down. This is gold right here. Ask God that before you're in a bad season. <laughs> I've learned to do that. Sit down and say, just write it out in my prayer journal, whatever, say, Lord, what am I missing? Because you and I, we're like the sheep. We just can't, can't really walk straight. God's going this way and we're following and we just start to list to the right. And it's a healthy question to stop and turn to God and say, Lord, what am I missing? There's something I'm missing. God shows them where they went wrong and in that, God opens the door for them to repent and be restored. They hadn't listened to the Lord, but it was their idolatry that led them into this sin. So this is the conclusion from the prophet's message. The Midianites were not their problem. Their hearts were. Isn't that interesting? The Midianites were not their problem. Their hearts were. The, the Midianites were just a symptom of the poor choices they had made. If they were to get their hearts right with God, God would deal with their enemy. This is an incredible point. It's not on your notes, but you can write it down if you like. Sin when God's people walk in sin, it renders them powerless to their enemy. It does. When you and I walk, a sh walk um, how do I want to say this? When you and I walk differently or, sorry, I hit my head really hard this weekend again. I don't know what's up with my melon. I just keep banging it. And since then, I've struggled putting words together on and off. I think I'm fine. I think. <laughs> 
I don't know what I'm saying, but if God's going that way and you walk that way, there's going to be a problem. That's what I'm trying to say to you, okay? Forget the fancy words. I should have written it down. That's why I'm reading my notes today a little bit. You guys probably noticed. Okay? So it renders God's people powerless to their enemy. But when you and I address the sin and let God deal with our sin, then, then God can deal with our enemy. It's so true. But apart from walking with God, we're powerless. When does Satan have a heyday with the church? Well, when the church isn't following God. Because God's the strength of his people. So the Midianites were not their issue. Their poor choices were. And if they could admit that, if they could bring their hearts to God, God could change it. Well, this is where the story gets super good. And this is about the point when I realized I had way too much content in first service. Verse 11, (laughs) this is what it says. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. Why I love this verse is because this is where the main character gets introduced. It's not Gideon. It's Jesus. This is actually a Jesus story. And by the way, do you know that the whole Bible is a Jesus story? It's telling the story of God. In fact, some people put it together like the little creative where it's like it's not history, it's his story. Woohoo. Pretty cool, write that down, huh? His story, okay? But this is a Jesus story. Now, why is it a Jesus story? Look at the character who comes in verse 11. He's the main character. It's the angel of the Lord, capital A. Now, this angel of the Lord, he shows up often in the Old Testament, and we know a couple things about him. When he shows up and he speaks, he speaks audibly as God. When he speaks, the Bible attributes it to God speaking. And not only that, when people hear him speak, they attribute it to God. They don't say, wow, an angel appeared to me. They don't say, I had a vision. They say, oh no, I saw the Lord. And the people are actually filled with terror. Like the kind of terror that Peter and James and John got when Jesus was transfigured before them and they saw his glory on the mountain. They saw him for who he was, God's son. And they became terrified. This person is no other than Jesus. It's a theophany, an Old Testament appearance of Christ. Now you might say, how do we know it's Jesus? Isn't God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Mark can talk about that more in hermeneutics, but this is what it is. Real short, we know no one's seen God the Father because the Bible says that. No one has seen God any time. John wrote that. We know Jesus is the expressed image of the Father. That's why when Philip said, show us the Father, Jesus said, you've seen me. I'm the image of the Father. And we know that the Spirit of God is always personified as fire or a dove or something like that because he's a spirit. The only person actually in the Bible who appears in human form as God is Jesus every single time. So this is a Jesus story and Gideon is living in it. I love that. That's what makes Gideon's life so great. Not that he was a super awesome dude. It's that he was living in a Jesus story. And when Jesus asked him to be a part of it, Gideon said yes. We're going to talk about that later. But guys, for you and I as a church today, we're living in a Jesus story too. Guys, I hope you know it. God has been so speaking to our church, giving us a vision for the future a vision for the future that God wants to reach people in Southern Oregon, not just talent, Phoenix, Medford, Ashland. We're talking all of Southern Oregon. He's calling you and I to be a part of it. He's calling you and I to be a small piece in his story and what he is doing. And the question you and I need to ask ourselves is, are we going to say yes to Jesus? I was going to talk about it later, but I'm just going to talk about it right now because we may run out of time, okay? The key to living a life that is fully leveraged for the glory of God or the key to living a life that when you get to the end of it, you look back and you say, I have no regrets. The key to living that kind of life is saying yes to Jesus often. That's the secret sauce. Say yes to Jesus often. It's really easy. He wants to do something. He wants to invite you and I to do it, but who's gonna say yes to it? And the people who say yes to it, they're the ones who live the wild life, the adventurous life, the hard life, but the worthwhile life. Say yes to Jesus often. 
if you and I as God's people, we could just learn that one little step of faith, our lives would be radically changed. Radically changed. I mean, God has a good plan for us as a church. And if you're here seeking the Lord, you don't know the Lord yet, God has a good plan for your life. The greatest thing you could ever do is say yes to his son Jesus and follow him. Greatest thing you could ever do. It will actually transform you, the Bible says, from the inside out. Well, let's keep reading. So Jesus is here, and he's incognito. He's undercover. He's the angel of the Lord, but look what it says. He comes and he sits under the terebinth tree, which was an Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. So the Lord has come, but instead of coming with all his glory, he comes a little differently. He comes like a, so- a sojourner, a stranger, like a wanderer who's just passing through the land. We'll see later he has a staff, and by his interactions with Gideon, you get the, the idea that Gideon doesn't realize up front who he's talking to. So Jesus has come, he's sitting by the tree, watching Gideon thresh wheat in a wine press. Now we meet Gideon, my boy Gideon. Okay, the first thing we realize about Gideon is he's not the bravest dude on the block. Okay, he is threshing his wheat in a wine press. That's where you make wine. Not bread, that would be (laughs) a threshing floor, if you were wondering what the term would be that he needs. Now, the reason he's in the wine press is because he's afraid the Midianites are going to see that he has grain. Because remember, any time the Jews harvested their stuff, they come and they take it away. So normally you would have your threshing floor, this is what I understand, on a higher location like a hilltop or something where the breeze could blow the chafe or chaff, however you want to say that, away as you thresh the grain. You would need oxen to tread it out and, you know, it's you got to throw it up in the air. There's quite a bit of work going into it. And you need that fresh air to really make it happen. Well, Gideon is in a wine press trying to thresh grain. You can imagine it's probably not working very well. And the other thing you could probably imagine is he probably doesn't have a lot. Wine presses weren't that big. So if he's doing his grain in there, it just tells you how poor they actually were. Gideon probably didn't have a lot. And he's afraid. He's trying to hide what he does have. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, Oh, I love this. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. <clears throat> Here's Gideon in the wine press. He thinks he's all alone. I wonder if that caught him off guard. Because the whole time he's like, do you think the Midianites are here? Do you think? And all of a sudden the Lord's like, hey, mighty man of valor. He probably jumped. Threw the grain a little higher that time. Okay? Well, it catches him off guard. And I have no doubt he looked over his shoulder both ways. Are you talking to me? I'm, I'm the only one in here. Who are you talking to? All right, this is what we're going to see about Gideon. Gideon has a very low opinion of himself, a very humble opinion. And the Lord is not mocking Gideon when he comes to him and says, mighty man of valor. God is speaking to his calling and his potential, not his behavior. God is speaking to his calling and his potential, not his behavior. Because God knew what he was doing in Gideon. He knew what Gideon could be, and he was calling Gideon to rise to it. And this is the other key you want to know is, (laughs) the Lord is with you. God's going to keep telling him that over and over. Gideon, the Lord is with you. Gideon, I'm sending you. Gideon, I'm going to be with you to deliver you. The reason Gideon could could be mighty, the reason he could be courageous, the reason he could be victorious is because of that one statement right there, the Lord is with you. If Jesus is with you, that changes everything. Now, this is our principle number two. And that is when God gives his people a mission, he also gives them a commission. When God gives them a mission, he gives them a commission. When he gives a plan, he calls you and I to be a part of it. Gideon's about to find that out. They're in trouble. They're oppressed. They're asking God to deliver them from Midian. God wants to deal with their sin, but he's also going to deal with the Midianites. And in order to do that, he's going to call Gideon to lead an army. Gideon, who's hiding in the threshing floor, I'm hiding in the wine press, threshing his grain, he's going to call Gideon to lead an army. I think the Lord must have so much fun putting his plans together. Who's the last guy everyone else would pick? Him. That's who we're going to do with him right there. Look what it says. Gideon said to him, and his answer is kind of pathetic in some ways. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all of his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us 
and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Do you guys remember the old Star Wars movie? You guys watched the old Star Wars movie? The original ones with Luke Skywalker, and he's like super whiny all the time, complaining. And you're like, what kind of a hero is this? My dad always called him Luke Skywiner when I was a kid. <laughs> all right, well, this is our Luke Skywiner. He's scared. He's despondent. He's hopeless. They've been oppressed. He's been looted and raided. He's been afraid for his life for years. And the Lord steps right into that hopelessness, that darkness, and he starts to speak hope there. He goes, Gideon, I got a plan, and I want you to be a part of it. And you know, Gideon is so overwhelmed by his own insignificance that he's missing out on the significance of the one who stands before him. And Gideon's not wrong in what he's saying. God did deliver them to the Midianites, but he assumed that that meant God had abandoned them. That was wrong. Couldn't be any further from the truth. God hadn't abandoned them. God was so for them, he allowed Midian to oppress them so they would return to him. God was so loving that when the moment they turned him and cried out, who does he send? A prophet. And right behind the prophet comes Jesus. I mean, there's, some, there's some powerful symbology there. When does Jesus show up on the scene when God's people cry out for him? God loved Israel. He hadn't abandoned them. He was for them. What they were going to recognize or realize is that God hadn't forsaken them. They had forsaken him. And in his faithfulness, he's going to draw them back to the Midianites. Then the Lord, verse 14, turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? I love this. It's like God didn't even hear the complaints. But something else unique happened. Look at verse 14 again. Then the Lord turned to him. Do you ever wish you could have been there to see what these stories looked like? Don't you? It said that the Lord turned to him. I don't know what it looked like in their conversation. They had been talking up to this point. But something happened in the dynamic of their conversation. The Lord actually turned and faced Gideon. And I can only imagine that when the Lord turned to him, he must have looked him right in the eyes. Man, how powerful of a moment. I wonder if Gideon's heart stood still. The Lord, I, I imagine the Lord looked him right in the eyes and he says to Gideon, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. And this is the key again. Have I not sent you? Boom. You stop the sermon right there. Gideon, the reason you're gonna be successful in this endeavor is because I'm sending you. I'm sending you. And so he said to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. God doesn't deny Gideon's view of his own inability. But if Gideon had lived like four or 500 more years after this, if I have that timeline right, I probably don't. It's longer than that. He would have met somebody named Paul. It would have been closer to 1,000, wouldn't it, Mark? 800, right? 402, and then 400 again. So closer to 800. If he had lived 1,000 years, he would have read Paul's writings later when Paul wrote and said that God chooses the weak things of the world, the insignificant things, the base things, the foolish things. Those are the things God chooses. And God uses those weak things to put to shame the strong so that at the end of the day, no one can take the credit for it. All the glory goes to the Lord. So Gideon's looking at God going, you've picked the wrong candidate. And the Lord goes, no, you're the perfect candidate. And guys, that's so encouraging. I've always told people, do you ever feel like you're like less than stellar? Have you ever felt that way? You're like, some of these people, God loved them just a little bit more. <laughs> I feel insignificant at times. I feel weak. Guess what? I'm the perfect candidate. If you feel that way, you are the perfect candidate for God to use. And God can use you to do mighty, incredible things. He can and he will. 
I believe that. And look what he says to Gideon after Gideon says that. Uh, verse 15, so he said, oh, sorry, verse 16. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. The third time, Gideon, I am with you. I am calling you. First he said, the Lord is with you. Then he said, I'm calling you. Now he's saying, dude, I'm with you. I'm with you, Gideon. When God gives a vision to his people, he's the one who sees it through to the accomplishment. God is. And it didn't matter how many soldiers Midian was going to bring. They brought themselves. They brought Amalek. They brought everyone with them. It doesn't, they could bring as many people as they wanted. They were doomed to lose because God was with Gideon. There's another way you could look at it. No matter how bad the odds were, there was no way Gideon could fail because God was with him. Guys, that's so powerful. And it's such a good word for you and I as the church to live with that idea of God's greatness. Again, if God is for us, who can be against us? That's actually our third principle. If God is for you, who can stand against you? No one can. Paul wrote that in Romans chapter 8. When God calls us and he's with us, the outcome is certain because the outcome rests on him. My part, your part, Gideon's part, is just to say, yes, Jesus. Okay, it doesn't make sense to me. Even when Gideon, we'll see next week, when Gideon gets the biggest army he can possibly get, it still wouldn't have been enough by human means to win. He was outnumbered. This is an impossible vision. God was asking him to do something there was no way he could accomplish. There was no way Israel could accomplish. But they were going to accomplish it anyways with 300 people, by the way. 300 people. How many of you guys have ever been like, you know what, let's go to battle. They have thousands upon thousands, countless. On top of that, they also have camels, hairy beasts upon which they ride. And me and my 299 buddies are going to go kill them all. I mean, what kind of battle plan is that? They did it. We're going to get there in a few weeks. There's no way they could have lost because God was with them. Don't you know they were terrified? <laughs> but God was with them. God was for them. And that was all they needed. Principle number three, if God is for you, who can stand against you? And this is what I want to say to you guys. God has given us an audacious vision as a church, an audacious vision. It's not just like the Lord's like, hey, I want you to reach Ashland. That would have been hard enough. Hello, does anybody, everyone who lives in Ashland, we all know that, right? That would have been hard and weird enough. But our vision was bigger than that. God wants to reach talent in Phoenix and Medford. We're like, wow, that's quite a bit. But we're in it, Jesus. And the Lord has expounded that vision. Guys, the leadership of our church, we feel impressed on our hearts. God wants to reach Southern Oregon. He doesn't want to stop with our area. He wants to keep moving. You know what's incredible? I talked to another Calvary Chapel pastor, same size church as ours, on the other side of the Siskiyous and Klamath. Guess what God told him? The same thing. Isn't that funny how God does that? That's an audacious vision. And it's not going to be possible by any means we have. We don't have the resources, the people, or the finances. But if God is for us, we can't lose. And for us as a church, we need to decide, are we all in, Jesus? I, so often, God asks you and I to take the first step of faith. He does. And our leaders, we've been meeting this week out of our week of prayer and fasting, and our elders are meeting again today, and we're asking ourselves this question, what is our risk tolerance right now? How far are we willing to say yes to Jesus? How far will we go? Are we all in? Or are we going to hold back? Guys, I think the Lord is asking us all that question. What's your risk tolerance? Are you all in? Because what you guys saw in that video, what we feel God calling us to is way bigger than that. And it's going to take every single one of us here and then some to really see it happen. Well, I'm excited for it. So saying yes to Jesus Let's keep going. We'll close it out. So Gideon, verse 17, says, Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. 
Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering. I set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. Now, a lot of times people can give Gideon a hard time. Like, oh, the guy just didn't have faith or he couldn't receive an answer from the Lord. But hey, listen, if some strange man appeared to you and told you God was sending you to go take on an army of thousands with little to no help, wouldn't you want to make sure it was the Lord first? And you know what? God is, God is so good. When he speaks to you and I, he's not afraid to confirm it either. In fact, how often is God speaking to you and I that he's also confirming in unique ways to us, showing us that this is him speaking to us? And so Gideon says, hey, can, I, can, I, can, we, can we discern if this is the Lord? Can I go bring an offering? And God says, absolutely, Gideon. Go bring your offering here. And I love this part. So Gideon went in and he prepared a young goat, cooked up a young goat, and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour, the meat he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and he brought them to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. I don't know what kind of sacrifice Gideon was making, but he runs into the house, he cooks a whole goat, makes broth with it, and has all the meat in the basket and the bread. He comes running back out to the Lord. It probably took him a couple hours, and the Lord's waiting for him. Verse 20, then the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat of the unleavened and the unleavened bread and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Man, if you were asking for a sign, you just got it. Hey, I, you know, this is a great vision you got here, but let's really make sure this is the Lord. <laughs> This is what happened to Gideon. Now Gideon, because he's a sharp dude, perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. It's at this point Gideon realized he was with God. So Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Gideon's like, I'm going to die. Then the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. Can you imagine what that must have been like? All right, range the bread and the meat, poured out the broth, and the angel of the Lord touches it, and the rock Fire, fire comes out of the rock. I don't know how that worked, but it did. So fire came out of the rock and it totally torches the sacrifice and Jesus vanishes from sight. Whoa. But there was, a better, there was a bigger exchange that happened there because up to this point, God was appearing to Gideon as the sojourning stranger. But from now on, he's gonna talk to Gideon in a very personal, conversational way. In fact, if you were to look at this, to me, I highlight that it's at this point Gideon went from encountering God to a personal relationship with God. I don't think he was just the Lord God of Israel anymore. I think he was the Lord God of Gideon. Because when God speaks to Gideon from this point on, it's, he's not appearing to Gideon physically to make it happen. He's not sending a prophet to share with Gideon what needs to happen. He's just speaking it directly to Gideon. However that worked in Gideon's heart, in his mind, however he heard God's voice, just like God speaks to you and I as we seek him. Gideon entered this relationship with God and God is now directing his life. And so the Lord speaks to him after this powerful exchange. He says to him, peace be with you. Do not fear you shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. To this day, it is still in the Ophrah of the Bees rites. The Lord is peace. We don't have time to develop all of that today. But what a powerful picture of the gospel. Paul would write later that it's Christ who made peace between me and God. That I could receive God's forgiveness. Chuck Smith would always put it this way because Paul would write his letters, grace and peace from God the Father. You guys remember that? Well, Chuck Smith would always say, you cannot know the peace of God until you've known the grace of God. And you can look at this moment, Gideon has known the grace of God and now he's experiencing God's peace. And maybe you're here today and you're looking for that peace. And the first thing you need is God's forgiveness, God's love in your life. The peace follows that. Well, let's close this out. I've said that twice now. We really are gonna close this out. First service, I didn't lie to them. I just told them the truth. I said, look guys, I apologize. I have way too much content, so I'm just gonna preach you all to death and I'm gonna reorganize it for second service. <laughs> All right, let's end it out then. 
<clears throat> so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace, verse 24. To this day it is still an Ophrah of the Abizrites. Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull and the second bull of seven years old and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the wooden image that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement and take the second bull and offer it as a sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. We're gonna talk about this more next week, but I wanna give you a few thoughts, a few thoughts, okay? First is this, God wanted him to deal with the sin issue first. Okay, Gideon, I'm gonna use you. We are gonna defeat Midian, but before we do that, we gotta deal with the sin. The household idol that your father and that your town worships, that's gotta go away. I think for a couple reasons, and probably the big one is, is God didn't want them to go out and beat the Midianites and say, well, who knows? Maybe Baal did this for us. We've been worshiping him. No, God was making it clear. He was the one delivering them. So the idol had to go. But also there's something else to that. God wants to deal with our sin, remember, as his people before he deals with our enemy. He's gonna deal with our sin first. And you wanna get in to do that. The second thing you wanna notice from this is that God told him to take the two bowls, his father's two bowls. Now, I imagine he probably used those for pulling the altar down. But God told him to offer the second one as an offering. How long have the children of Israel been oppressed by Midian? Seven years. How old was the second bull? Seven years. Isn't that interesting? Something significant there. The last thing I want you to see, and we'll end the sermon here. And worship team, you can come back on up. After he tears it down, and by the way, it's so cool. God's like, I want you to go rip down the altar of Baal. I want you to take the wood image, which was in a Asherah pole, and I want you to chop it up, and then I want you to slaughter your dad's ox, and I want you to take the wood from their idol and use that as the firewood for my offering. How cool is that? I mean, God knows how to get it done. But there's something you want to see here. Look what it says, verse 26. And the Lord said to him, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock. That word could also be translated stronghold. Gideon, I want you to build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this stronghold and the proper arrangement. God was, gonna, God was going to take what was a stronghold of darkness and turn it into an altar for praise. And I firmly believe in my heart that that's how God works. That's why Peter could write and say, God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light to declare his praises. And guys, for you and I as a church, this is a dark place with dark, dark strongholds. But I'm convinced that in the places of those strongholds, God wants to set up altars for praise. God wants to see men and women coming to faith in Jesus, turning to Jesus, receiving the love of Jesus. And he's calling you and I to be a part of that. The question we need to ask ourselves is, are we willing to say yes to Jesus? So worship team.